So welcome everyone to MSD at Home, which continues to take advantage of our virtual campus by engaging with a diverse range of thinkers and practitioners in architecture and design, both locally and globally. My name is Professor Alan Pert, and I'm the new Clean Shaven Director of the Melbourne School of Design. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands in which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been custodians of these lands for thousands of years. I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who may be listening tonight. Now tonight we begin our first in a series of talks with academics from inside the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. And it is my immense pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, our very own Professor Helene Frichot. Now, Helene Frichot is Professor of Architecture and Philosophy and Director of the Bachelor of Design here at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Helene is also Guest Professor and a former Director of Critical Studies in Architecture at the School of Architecture, KTH in Stockholm, Sweden, where she was based between 2012 in 2019, before we could lure her back to Australia. Now, drawing on the two disciplines in which Elaine is trained, architecture and philosophy, her research engages a transdisciplinary field by experimenting with feminist theories and practices, while specifically drawn on new materialism and the post-humanities. And in 2017, Helene was the recipient of a Swedish sabbatical grant, outcomes of which included her book, Creative Ecologies, Theorising the Practice of Architecture, and published by Bloomsbury in 2018. And along with Isabel Doucette, he edited a special edition of Architectural Theory Review, Resist, Reclaim, Speculate, Situated Perspectives on Architecture and the City in 2018. Helene was also an editor and the project leader on the double volume Architecture in Effect by ACTAR in 2019, gathering research emerging from a former Swedish Research Council grant and with Katarina, Gabby Elson, she participated in the Swedish Research Council grant tra Traversal Writing, one writing experiment of which was recently published for the TU Delft journal Writing Place in 2019. Now, Helene is also author of How to Make Yourself a Feminist Design Power Tool, Art, Architecture, Design Research 2016, and Dirty Theory, Troubling Architecture or by Art, Architecture, Design Research 2019. She's on the steering group of the Architectural Humanities Research Association based in the UK, and forthcoming publications include Helene Frichot and Naomi Stead, Writing Architectures, Fictal Critical Approaches by Bloomsbury again in 2020, Marco Yost and Helene Frichot, Architectural Effects after Deleuze and Guattari, Routledge 2021. Now tonight's lecture, Infrastructural Love and Other Architectural Effects, is dedicated to infrastructural love posited as a reorientation of our thinking with and practicing of architecture. Now, before I welcome Helene Frichot, just a reminder to everyone to use the Q&A function tonight. We'll be taking questions um, after Helene's talk. So welcome everyone and welcome Helene Frichot. Thank you so much, Alan, for the kind invitation. So as Alan has explained, this is the beginning of a series uh, called Melbourne Speaks. Only tonight I'll be speaking about my experience in Stockholm, in fact, teaching in Korteho, the Royal Institution of Technology uh, there in the School of Architecture. I'm just going to share my screen. Now, this means at the outset, I need to acknowledge my debt to my colleagues with whom I've worked over the last couple of years. Hannes Freikom, Sepede Karami, and Adria Carbonell Rabasa, with whom we ran a series of design studios dedicated to infrastructural love and in infrastructural cares. And in fact, we're working on a book project around these themes right now. In time, also, I'm going to offer my acknowledgements to the students who travelled with us uh, through a series of studios. It's very important to kind of call them out in terms of the collaborative work we did with them. Infrastructural love, architecture and other affects. In a way, I'm going to take us through this as something like a storybook. That's certainly how it's structured and written up. So we'll begin quite simply with some questions. What is infrastructure or what can infrastructure do? Infrastructure is everywhere, ubiquitous. 
It's in the fibre optics of smart city telecommunications. It supports the basic utilities of water, electricity and gas. It coordinates massive transport networks. It is the socio-technological and spatio-material glue that ties everything together. It can be found in so simple a structure as the public loo, which can be rethought, as Sarah Sarko has, as a menstruation network. Infrastructure and its relation to architecture. The architectural support systems that are entangled with infrastructure space include public toilets, waiting rooms, warehouses, call centres, parking lots, toll booths, public toilets. Again, these are architectures distributed across urban and peri-urban, suburban, hinterland and rural milieus. They are ordinary architectures. The title of our book project that we're working on and the title of our initial stu design studio that we led um, is based on uh, an essay and project that Hannes Freikom and Olga Tengval undertook called Infrastructural Love, where they happened across what's called the Inlands Barnen, originally an infrastructural rail line transporting resources from the north of Sweden toward the south that was abandoned um, early into its history. And along this rail line, they imagined a series of somewhat um, whimsical follies, I suppose, as modes of intervention and frame this around their notion of infrastructural love. So this was our first point of inspiration. But we also need to think, as Reinhold Martin alerts us in his book, Urban Apparatus, we need to be reminded of the way urbanisation, and I quote him, is built on massive cracks. A widening gulf between wealth and poverty divides populations on multiple scales, both on the ground and in the social and cultural imagination. Differentials of race, class and gender crisscross this divide, cutting new crevices and occasionally building bridges. These differentials and the fissures and bridges they entail are without exception enacted by material bodies, infrastructures, things. He draws our attention too to the number of ways in which we can think infrastructures and how infrastructures are also a social problem. Again, the way they cut that intersectional line across gender, race, class. Here Richard Gray, in an early iteration of our studio, begins to think this idea of infrastructure as something that gets rolled out across an existing landscape. He speculates. It's not a project that he plans to build, it's rather a way of thinking with infrastructures and their impacts. So infrastructure. Infrastructure, as Ned Rossiter argues, makes worlds and logistics governs them. Logistics, infrastructure, manifests as roads, railways, shipping ports, intermodal terminals, airports and com communications facilities and technologies. Logistics infrastructure enables the movement of labour, commodities and data across global supply chains. So here specifically we're reminded that there are a number of different things and effects that are moved across these infrastructural systems. Here Richard Gray again imagines a uh, disaster scenario in Stockholm, let's say the Russians have invaded, which is a strangely Swedish anxiety that does emerge from time to time. Here Richard Gray puts together what he calls the kit city, how to roll out those key infrastructures and institutions that might be required to recompose a city outside of town. Thinking infrastructures, thinking infrastructure space. In the retinal afterglow is a soupy matrix of details and repeatable formulas that generate most of the space of the world, what we might call infrastructure space. So here Keller Easterling is reminding us that most of what surrounds us is composed exactly as a form of infrastructure, enabling flows and imposing stoppages. Maria Johansson even reminds us that out in the parks or further out of town, we might think infrastructures as the ways in which the wilderness is divided up in terms of also relations between humans and non-humans. Again, infrastructure in terms of its social implications. In effect, Judith Butler writes, the demand for infrastructure is a demand for a certain kind of inhabitable ground and its meaning and force derives pre precisely from that lack 
it seems that the space of appearance is not ever fully separable from questions of infrastructure and architecture. Butler argues that when we move infrastructures such as streets, boulevards, public squares, we move, remove the capacity for a body politic to come together to protest. We remove this inhabitable ground where we can have our voices heard. From the book Architecture and Feminisms, Huda Tayob describes a small shop. Here we can see how infrastructure might even be imagined on a very intimate scale in terms of how an interior is organised and its goods distributed. Infrastructure, when we read the literature around infrastructure, it's very often associated with failure. Infrastructure is also often associated with repetition, with rhythm. Infrastructure, as Reinhold Martin argues, is what repeats. Orchestrating ritual functions, it tends to come into view only when the repetitions cease. When a city dweller turns on the faucet and water does not flow, an entire plumbing system, if not an entire regional watershed, leaps into the cognitive field. Here there is the argument that we find across the literature around infrastructure that reminds us constantly of the impact of failure, that moment at which infrastructure, which has been otherwise in the background of our consciousness, leaps into view. We suddenly recognise our profound dependence on it. So failure is this strong theme that comes through and failure appears at that moment at which that repetition we're expecting suddenly stops and does not occur. Here, Eric Lecrans plays with this idea of repetition in focusing on one particular makeshift electricity pole set up in a construction site. What we argue with my colleagues within the studio is that much of what we do or much of what we do is made possible because of the infrastructures that support us alongside the ordinary architectures that require our loving care. When infrastructures and their associated spaces fail, this is not just a technological failure, it's a social and a political failure. These are the observations we commenced with when we're inviting a group of students to stop, look around them, reflect briefly on your everyday environment worlds, be affected and in turn acknowledge how you arouse affects. Here is Marlon Bergman, one of our students, looking at the lost things that we find on infrastructural networks and trying to imagine a space in which they might be recovered. But why infrastructural love? And what is the role of affect here? In my title, I speak to infrastructural love and other architectural affects. When Keller Easterling speaks of infrastructure space, as she does in extra state craft, and as she describes in organisation space, when she speaks of infrastructure space as sporting a, a dispositions, she describes the disposition of the river, or perhaps the disposition of the inclined plane down which a ball is apt to roll. Infrastructures do something to us, enabling something to happen. But we can also consider how a small child expresses a sunny disposition, a way of being that is as much a way of becoming, because a sunny disposition now can transform into a temper tantrum in moments. Disposition can be related to a philosophical definition of affect. Affect is not to be confused with effect, as in cause and effect or an effect of the light. We can speak of someone affecting something or some situation of being, and of being affected in turn by which we mean his or her or its disposition is transformed, changing state from one moment to the next. And this assumes that something has happened, something has happened, whether on a conscious or unconscious level, that shifts how you feel and what you are likely to do next. Affect is a complex philosophical term. I, in particular, draw on Deleuze and Spinoza when I turn to affect and what it is supposed to do as a concept. It has its own theory and it has even its own field of studies, affect studies. In its common usage, we generally define it in relation to feelings. I feel sad, I feel happy. Or else we catalog it as one of the emotions. That is how societal contexts approve of, say, the designation of feelings and their appropriate moments of expression. But how you are affected in terms of how your emotional well-being is impacted is not something that can be easily stabilised. 
who feels happy all the side or who feels happy all the time and how very tedious that would be. But affect, I have to point out, is something that's distinct from both feelings and emotions. In the reciprocal, if unbalanced, relation between affected and affecting modes, an encounter becomes a relation that forms a more or less durable composition. Relations are contingent, though. Who knows what might happen next, what will work for you or not? Affect, finally, is what increases and diminishes your capacity to act in a world. In its relation, in its relations, the relay of affecting and being affected produces rhythms. There is a rhythm to infrastructure. As Reinhold Martin has argued, infrastructure is that which repeats, like exercise or teaching. For instance, curricula, the ones with which we deliver our teaching and learning, is a kind of pedagogical infrastructure. Here finally is where I turn to the collective of students that my colleagues and I have worked with over the last couple of years and acknowledge them and acknowledge the thinking that they have done with us and how they've helped us to think through the problems that we've shared. And I list their names here. But in order to move into a description of some of what we did in the studio and to show more of the work, as you'll see, what I'm performing at the moment is an interruption of what I'm conveying to you by speaking incrementally about some of the student work. In order to set us up a little bit, I need to explain some of our ambitions or some of the structure and infrastructure that we use to set up the studio. One thing that was of interest to us was how to think of the relation between architecture and also the architectural humanities alongside the emergence of the environmental humanities. So how the humanities disciplines, uh, to put it simply perhaps, turn away from a discourse on discourse and think through their methodologies in relation to specific and cited problems on the ground. There is it is though a sudden apprehension of environmental concerns, as though you had forgotten the environment worlds in which you are daily embroiled and they suddenly are drawn to your attention. Remember again the important role of failure with infrastructures and how failure suddenly brings to immediate consciousness that upon which we depend. After Gilles Deleuze and also Isabelle Stengers, this is also an attempt to think par le milieu, to think from the midst of what's happening to you but also to reflect on what happens when the milieu begins to think you, when we flip the formula and challenge where we think we're positioned as subjects. And in the midst of all this work, following Donna Haraway, it important, it's, in, it's of crucial importance to recognise that it matters what stories we use to tell our stories. The stories we tell in architecture as elsewhere have an impact on our listeners, have an impact on what we might do together. Furthermore, and this is what we have tried to frame, um, myself and my colleagues, is a demand for a transversal modes of experimentation across what Felix Guattari has described as the three ecological registers. So when we look to environments and environmental worlds, when we look to ecological relations, this is not just a problem of our uh, natural environments out there, it's rather concerning uh, the production of subjectivities or mental ecologies, the construction of socialities or social ecologies, as well as environmental ecologies, both natural and culture, or understood as hybrids of nature's cultures. And in all, certainly what we found amidst the environmental humanities is a distinct interest, a turn toward the ways in which we would normally understand designers, artists or architects to behave, uh, an interest in project work, how practical experiments um, can be drawn and understood, uh, take their inspiration from the creative disciplines. We see this in Donna Haraway's um, Staying with the Troubles. We see this in the introduction to the Routledge Companion to the Environmental Humanities, where a stress on uh, creative experimentation and storytelling is to be found. Here too, um, and as mentioned in the introduction, some further work that supported this entry into the design studio work and to speak to the research around it, is a collaboration with Isabelle Doucet, 
on this special issue of architectural theory review. And here too is a refrain towards which I will uh, return, uh, the resist, reclaim, speculate, how we achieve these situated perspectives, considering uh, the emergence of the environmental humanities and other modes of orientation in our own discipline. With this special issue of ATR, we set out to discuss theory of architecture as a practice. We wanted to resist what we perceived to be a persistent division of labor between theoria and praxis. In fact, we wanted to challenge this bifurcation of the critical and the projective. We wanted to do this, and we wanted to do it by drawing attention to the specificity of situations. We wanted to look to practices and how these are always entangled with the lives of people's places and things. We wanted to see how far it was possible to refer to very specific situated problems in response to which we believe it's crucial to resist ready-made answers and also to accept the constraint of the milieu in which we do find ourselves. And so this was the invitation that we extended. And I raise it here too because Isabel joined us in the studio in Stockholm several times as a guest critic and will write around the studio for this planned book project of ours. But again, our cry in the midst of this was how do we resist, reclaim and speculate in the midst of our own disciplinary formations? Here in particular, speaking to architecture. Likewise, in creative ecologies, where I was attempting to chart out something like an ecology of practices after Isabel Stengers and what that might mean. Looking especially to perhaps more marginal practices and spaces of operation between art and architecture, for instance. Rethinking how we stay with the troubles of environment worlds. But amidst all of this too, and uh, this is where I'm going to just put in parentheses. I'm entering for a few slides the theory section. So if you want to kind of like put on gentle music in the background or take a drink, this would be the moment. <laughs> Coming out of critical studies in architecture, which is where this studio that I'm going to, that I've begun to introduce already, infrastructural love, emerges. Always at stake is this question of what is the critical position? How do we rearticulate it and rethink it in terms of its history? Uh, we can kind of bring it back to the Frankfurt School and imagine a critical project as being one that aims for emancipation. Uh, the critical position, though, um, is often uh, assumed in the first instance and often by students to be the position that you take as a sort of ne negative critique. Uh, so how do we kind of think through this? Isabel Stenger certainly points out the risks of being critical. Uh, in being critical, we tend toward activities of sorting, purification, isolation and making a case. Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, a former student of Donna Haraway, talks about the risk of being critical uh, is that we can take too much of a puzzle making approach attempting to fill the gap instead of thinking with. So we think in charting our fields, we simply have to fill that gap rather than staying with the difficulties of our fields of engagement. There is also the notion that a critical insight might be supposed to break with its past, which in the process renders that past obsolete. And what Stenge has asked us to do instead is to pause a moment to respect other practices, specifically ecologies of practice. To create interest in the sense emphasised by Isabel Stenger's Maria Puig de la Bella Casa points out, by situating in between, to situate interest is to find out how not to divide things, but how to relate things together. So rather than dividing through that form of critical um, critical uh, purification. It's about finding the gaps between things and finding how things relate to each other. Now, while critical constructivism is racked with weariness, suspecting that it has contributed to the ongoing dismantling of the world, it may yet be reclaimed. And certainly this is part of Isabel Doucet and my project in the ATR special issue. Taking a critical approach that might be less about imposing a power position than approaching a problem by way of care. So care also is a strong thematic that ran through our studio. And it's a th thematic that by chance has run through uh, the MSD at Home series that I've hosted in speaking with Shannon Matten 
um, Anna Miliacci Key and uh, Reinhold Martin, each of which in their specific projects and pedagogies involve an ethics of care as a strong thematic. So this is a project of reorientating our critical positioning, bringing the critical alongside the projective or bringing together a speculative and a pragmatic orientation to avoid debunking and to instead speculatively venture critical standpoints that are caring. This is not a fixed expl explanatory position or a normative stance, nor an approach that determines the situation in advance. What it is or could be instead is how to be speculative by asking who cares or how to care and by which to aim to engage, as Maria Puig de la Bella Casa puts it, to engage with the material semiotic becoming of things. In a way, I think this is what was behind aspects of Marlon Bergman's project in, our, in, in one of our studio iterations, where she looks to what it might mean to care for a post-human landscape at Barkaby, a former airfield, how to think through a relationship with both the soil and its and processes of remediation, as well as to think with the labourers working on site in this process as well. Caring for both the non-human actor that is soil, as well as for the human actor who is the labourer, attending to these perhaps all too beautiful pavilions. But speculation. Speculative, to speculate, otherwise suggests a forward-looking orientation for which you are yet to gather any firm evidence. It's visionary even. An imaginative leap, a speculative gesture, a way of giving rise to the possible, a way of answering to a crisis in thinking today. This is a project that Isabelle Stangers with her colleague Didier Debay's project, as well as Isabelle Stangers and Vincien Dupre, who call out at the conclusion of women who make a fuss that think we must. The challenge of the speculative in architecture is that this term too often resounds with an economic opportunity or a profit-driven agenda. How instead is it wrested from an only or merely transactional relation? How do we speculate otherwise? Much like Isabel Doucet and I were attempting to put together uh, the critical with uh, the projective, we're basing some of this thinking also in Didier de Beza's work and his collaboration with Isabel Stangers. In the special issue of ATR, we have a dialogue that Isabel undertook with Didier de Beza, in fact. And just briefly, before I kind of open up to a, a much more um, explicitly project-based um, orientation, I'll just run through this particular formulation, seemingly uh, creating a, a point of um, tension in its conjunction of a speculative pragmatics. And now this notion of a speculative pragmatics in both Didier de Beza's work and Isabel Stenger's further draws on uh, the process philosopher Alfred North Whitehead's work. What Didier de Beza calls the speculative method is composed of five concepts. On the one hand, it has its rational constraints, considering necessity, logic and coherence. But on the other hand, it has its, something like its practical constraints in that you can take these rational constraints, but you still need to apply them to the diversity and differentiation of existence via processes of creativity. That, Didier de Bayes reminds us, must be applicable and adequate to the problems that we're attempting to confront. He explains that these five concepts set out a procedure, a speculative pragmatics, but not a recipe. For Vincent Dupre, who has worked with Isabel Stangers too, and whose work includes animal-human relations, as well as studies on the relations between the living and the dead, the pragmatic stance involves learning to follow practices, this time not to judge or condemn them, but to learn from them. This is then an adventure to create and to imagine, and at the same time to work within constraints. A speculative pragmatics leads us toward practices undertaken from the midst of environment worlds, par le milieu. So here we can come right back to Kotehoa, which is where these studios were being uh, delivered and where our collaboration was taking place. 
here is the somewhat famous, I believe by now, facade by Tom Virgod, local architects. But here too, there is uh, Bettina Schwarm's wonderful um, intervention in the windows on the second floor where we used to sit in our offices as teachers and researchers, calling out uh, to a world that um, we've been experiencing since the end of 2016, calling out that we won't build your wall. So this brings us into uh, the particular project or brief or outline or, or uh, provocation we had for students who joined us on this adventure in our studio. We started out by explaining to them that our understanding of architecture is less as a discrete object in a field or an autonomous icon in an urban milieu. Instead, we posit that architecture is what maintains the relations between people's places and things. Architecture is infrastructure and architecture supports infrastructures. Architecture emerges at the threshold where the pragmatic work of the engineer, pragmatic not in the philosophical sense, just in the everyday sense, proves insufficient. And it extends this pragmatism toward the imaginative construction of supportive spaces and relations, or at least it can. We attend to human and non-human relations amidst architectural environment worlds. We focus on the distributed architectural support systems that are associated with local and global infrastructures with a thematic focus on more than human urban landscapes, post-industrial interventions and reimagined institutions. So in a way, this could be read as our brief. In terms of those institutions, we had uh, student collaborators such as Eric Lecranz imagining what it would mean to think of a non-human embassy to take on an existing architecture and make it amenable to pests or what we would normally classify as pests. Uh, for this, he used a material handbook and for every rule or for a selection of rules that determined an adequate, uh, well-tempered internal environment for a human, he flipped these in, this, on their head. So instead that the environment would support um, other kinds of creatures to create this imaginary space of the non-human embassy. We further aimed within the studio to channel a feminist and intersectional ethos, engaging in ethics of care. Infrastructural love, which subsequently became infrastructural cares as the iteration of studios developed, demands that we spend more time caring for, repairing, supporting and maintaining the socio-technical and spatio-material infrastructures to facilitate our daily lives. How do infrastructures and their architectural affects support us and how do they fail us? Where can we as critical and creative designers informed by a feminist and new materialist and post-humanist ethos intervene to support more inclusive and humorous, adventurous and sheltering architectural support systems? Finally, how can we explore a methodological approach that forwards a poetic pragmatics? Now, something happened after the first term that we ran this studio. We discovered in dialogue with the students as we set series of tasks that a particular uh, approach began to develop. This was an attempt by students to measure out something that was that was extraordinarily um, uh, improbable somehow, for instance, uh, rather than simply demolishing um, a, a former concrete factory, why don't we celebrate that past and recognise all of the labour that has been undertaken there to produce concrete for a particular part of Stockholm and, re and uh, document all the parts of that factory in order to organise a parade through th central Stockholm and, and um, relocate that concrete factory on the other side of town as a, something of a museum. Uh, and this for us, uh, a project such as this began to speak of both a, a poetics, a, a sort of improbable project and yet one that's thought for provoking, as well as a pragmatics. How do we make the poetics work? Our poetic pragmatics as it emerged through these student teacher dialogues combines an attention to the details of architectural socio-tectonics with a speculative and visionary imperative to contribute to ameliorative world making practices. It's a concept that emerged from these collab collaborative efforts. Poetic pragmatics requires sufficient structural support for a sustained belief in this world. It's not about hiding the former concrete factory. It's about acknowledging also that industrial past. Here we have Chung Hun An, who is less 
acknowledging, well, in a way he is acknowledging um, the impact of uh, furious human industrial activity and imagining a monument to the post-Anthropocene, imagining a future in which there are no humans and yet something of a relic or an artefact still stands in the landscape with his monument of the post-Anthropocene. The, we had a very particular approach in the studio too, in these dialogues um, with students um, who were very much our collaborator, collaborators and helped us kind of think in process. Uh, we were using what we called an instructional approach. And this is something that I speak to in my small book, How to Make Yourself a Feminist Design Power Tool. Um, the notion of the instruction, and here I'm very much also uh, inspired by instructional approaches to art. Uh, is to undertake, well, as Deleuze and Guattari put it, an experimentation in contact with the real. But any form of instruction, and we're very familiar with these because we always issue our students in design studio with a brief at least, but we wanted to formulate the instructions as an in invitation to, toward experimentation. You could uh, misinterpret them if you would. The idea was to follow the instruction and see what you came up with. Um, we wanted also to use the instruction to... Uh, uh, ask students to kind of revalue what their former values are, to, to challenge prevalent practices where they rely on bad habits, mere opinions or prejudiced, prejudiced cliches. So the instructions sort of uh, could be followed in many ways. Uh, you had to take a risk, but you also had to take care. Here we have a project by Linnea Orgren, who again imagines something of a disaster scenario in Stockholm and seeks out a way to use former military um, tunnels and uh, rooms uh, way below um, the surface of Stockholm, which is infamously kind of rocky, uh, to hide national treasures. So with these instructions, for instance, it was important to invite students to pay attention, to pay attention to the ordinary architectures that support infrastructures. For instance, how to draw 100 infrastructural details in one week. So students in groups of four to five journeying through uh, the Tiabana around Stockholm, so the underground or the metro, were asked to look at just the ordinary small details they came across. They had to produce 100 infrastructural details in the week. In a week, only the 100th detail had to be an imaginary detail that they invented. And then the game was on to try and search for that imaginary detail amidst all of the other details that they'd documented. And here, it was very much a matter of um, inculcating a process of paying attention. How do you pay attention to those small everyday details that might have passed you by? Every design studio looks to its precursors. We use the precedent as a powerful tool. We also looked to how we could do this and we really attempted to encourage the students to look to more minoritarian examples in setting up their proliferating precursors and inviting them also to reinvent uh, their precedents in undertaking their own work. The irrational section cut was a group exercise we undertook where groups had to cut a section through uh, a site that they were working on and pull it together as something like a surrealist game of cadaverous ski. They were given an essay that I've written with a film critic, Miriam von Schantz, where we talk on the irrational section cut as something that plays with normative habits of representation. It's something that we draw from Gilles Deleuze's cinema books. So where sound and image don't quite glue together, where different scales clash, where different, different lives and environments are brought into juxtaposition. How do we use the convention of the section cut and make it to do other kinds of work for us was part of the challenge. There was also the smooth montage introduced by Hannes Freikom, my colleague, which is also part of his broader research uh, area. And as in most design studios, the, the role of the image and the affects it produced producers is very powerful. So we ask students to kind of um, uh, consider this, but not just in terms of developing their Photoshopping skills, but understanding that 
such images have a political have political implications in, in terms of the ways they're provoking us to reimagine environments and they, they need to be used with caution and as once as producing them we need to critique what it is we're in the midst of producing there's Hannes Freikom's essay uh, contribution to the after effects volume two of architecture and effect one of my personal favorites was the dirty models that we uh, invited students to undertake. And this one is very much inspired uh, by Jennifer Bloomer's dirty drawings. Here, the idea was to challenge yet again, what it is we think we're doing when we're undertaking models. And if we're simply making models as modes of representation after the fact, then it's worthwhile seeing what the model can do as, as something that's much more material and dirty and undertaken that sort of on the go. Also how we think about what materials we're bringing together when we are producing a model and perhaps considering using materials that aren't simply going to be coming off uh, the shelf at our favourite stationery store, but perhaps we're reusing the materials around us as we're finding them, uh, reusing discards and uh, offcuts and so forth. Joseph Boyce and his um, uh, fat and felt was, of course, a great inspiration here. In fact, um, uh, part of the part of the, the, the your 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 dirty model was as successful as disgusting it was was part of one of the criteria. And very importantly, it had to be really disgusting. And uh, this whole this whole idea of uh, dirt and dirtiness um, is also explored in this small book that Alan mentioned before, Dirty Theory: Troubling Architecture. So finally, amidst all of this, to return to the refrain that Isabel and Dusay have introduced in um, Architectural Theory Review, uh, we argue through these means by messing with some of the representational um, orthodoxies we have, for instance, by asking students not only to employ them, but to critique the process they're in the midst of undertaking. We suggest that when you resist, it's a status quo, the norm, a dominant image of thought that you're challenging. You're rethinking your own position. And when you reclaim, well, this is an old strategy, oft deployed by the repressed or the overlooked or the undervalued, the miss or the underrepresented. You take back or invent new tools and weapons. The insult that's been directed at you, you turn it around and you make it a tool by which to consider something else, make something else happen. Uh, when you speculate, finally, you do not impose values, but remain open to learning from the encounters you both suffer and enjoy attempting to forge relations to more resilient compositions, making the best of what happens to you, which is very much an ethico aesthetic approach. So thank you. I've got a couple of like slides with all the references we used to here at the end, but I'm gonna unshare my screen. And with this, that whole bunch of material, um, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Thanks very much, Elaine. You know, I think what's, what's really nice about your talk tonight is that, and you, and you mentioned this, that, you know, MSD at home, you did curate three speakers, you know, Reinhold Martin, um, Anna and Shannon. Um, and I think you can see the thread, um, and there is a commonality between those speakers um, that you've, you've managed to um, consolidate in very many ways through this discussion of ethics of care. Um, I mean, one of the things I think it was interesting about those three speakers, you know, whether you, we consider Reinhold's website, the Power website, um, or even this conversation around the Green Deal. You know, Anna talked about the notion of communication in the radio. Um, and then, you know, Shannon then I think took us into this conversation about kind of disciplinary divides and the opportunity for involving potentially other actors. And this is something you've talked about before as well. So I think, I mean, I, mean, I suppose this is, I would like to kind of kick off the conversation about, you know, your disciplinary base. This is something I've read uh, um, um, before um, in some of your, your, your writing that, you know, this notion of disciplinary divides like ethnography and the social sciences, um, you know, so this, this, studio you've run, you, you talk about environmental sciences, environmental humanities, obviously. Um, you know, so placing together anthropology, ethnography and research, uh, 
and design um, and what Shannon, I think, referred to as kind of multiple, multiple modalities. Um, you know, we really need these to be able to engage with the frictions in the world at the moment. And I wonder if you could just reflect on that a bit um, in terms of your own disciplinary base. But the second part of this is that, you know, what does it mean really for something like a Bachelor of Design sitting mm. in a comprehensive built environment faculty within a comprehensive university? No, indeed. Yeah, bring it right back to my new position and uh, my attempt to sort of understand this strangely lumpy beast that is the Bachelor of Design, which of course really uh, under its umbrella is bringing together quite a diverse suite of disciplines if there are 12 major pathways all the way from fine arts and music through to engineering with, with architecture, urban planning and design and landscape in the middle somewhere there. Uh, there's no doubt that there's a lot of lip service to um, the importance of the interdisciplinary, the cross-disciplinary, or I also like to describe it as the transdisciplinary. If we imagine it, two disciplines in encounter, how they transform each other if they're prepared to spend long enough uh, listening into each other. Um, the truth of it, as anyone knows who's sort of um, ended up making themselves a student for way too long, is that it's really, really, really difficult to put uh, a couple of disciplines together. So, you know, Shannon Matten spoke about how she couldn't imagine many places other than the new school where she'd find herself a position because the problem is you end up uh, never quite fitting adequately anywhere, uh, not architectural enough or not philosophical enough or maybe a little bit of an anthropologist but coming too much from, you know, uh, history or, or literature. I, in fact, I can't remember her first discipline now. I think it was something else altogether. Um, uh, so it's it's an ongoing challenge, and I think it's um, these these conversations are ones that, that are always full of surprises and are always a struggle. But they simply, you know, have to be uh, they have to be pursued. I think um, as institutions, we try to shelter them. But yeah. But do you think there's? Um, I mean, I mean, you obviously talk about poetry, but I mean, is there any obvious actors that you think are missing from from the design discussion? Um, at the moment, in terms of trying to, I mean, you talk about entrenched habits, for instance. You know, so how we how we tackle those entrenched um, um, habits, the mm -hmm. actors we might engage with. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, I think this is where uh, this is where uh, it is about the specificity of where we're coming from as well. So you know, you know your own bad habits the best, basically. Um, and uh, I think I think in in time inside spaces of teaching and learning, uh, one 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 of the good ways I think we can shake up our habits are, are in the ways we open up ourselves to, to the dialogue with students. Uh, so I know, you know, my experience from the Swedish context, sometimes, sometimes too much in this direction, but a sort of somewhat of a flattening of hier hierarchies where there's really this, um, uh, this demand that you kind of listen carefully and acknowledge the situated knowledge that your students are coming from. Um, so I think in a way, uh, in terms of those pedagogical practices, how we rethink those relations with students becomes very powerful. Very difficult, though, when you're dealing with a larger student cohort. So I don't know. I, the first thing I think of are some of our pedagogical habits, in fact, and how there's a, there's, there's a great tension between coming in and disciplining our students in a particular mode, but then giving them sufficient skills so that they can critique that disciplination. So we both need the disciplination, uh, you know, we need to kind of practice through repetition and so forth, but we need to be able to challenge where um, it's simply become a sort of empty refrain or it stopped meaning anything or it stopped being useful um, or where we've been carrying along, you know, biases for too long with the baggage of the discipline. So how do we maintain it, but how do we also continue to, to challenge it? Um, and certainly for me, this is how I read Isabel Stengers when she tries to articulate an ecology of practices. But it's hard to answer in a general way, I think. Hmm. Well, we've got quite a number of questions that have come in. So I might just jump to some of the questions. So I've got a, an anonymous um, attendee who says, I've long admired Helene's adventurous leaps between architecture and philosophy, and the political dimension intrigues me. Delving into the political, tell me, how does your notion of care relate to citizenship? particularly in our current crisis and the need for more effective modes of democratic engagement. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, you know, it's um, a striking moment to be speaking of infrastructures because there's nothing like the current COVID-19 crisis that brings these very vividly to mind. You know, if we think of the way any number of... Um, any number of scholars writing on infrastructures draw our attention to failure again and again. Um, and this question of care too, uh, you know, in, in talking about the relationship between care and citizenship, it makes me think specifically of Joan Tronto's work on an ethics of care, uh, where, she, where she argues in her work that this is the very project of democracy, how we undertake care. And she's got about, I forget whether it's five or six modalities in which we do this, caring for, caring with, caring about, and so forth. And... Um, uh, and I think this this um, this care in relation to citizenship also immediately sets up certain power relationships because if you are professing to be caring for citizens and yet that care is being experienced as something of a violent imposition, then you see very quickly how care can become despotic. So it's a it's a it's a it's a very kind of it's certainly a challenging um, a concept to be working with. And this is then when Maria Puig de la Bella Casa becomes interesting for me because she speaks to the difficulty of care. I think we also heard this with Shannon Matten speaking about how care uh, produces different effects. You know, the, our best of intentions with care can produce something quite um, uh, offensive um, or oppressive. Well, Helene, uh, just to touch on this notion of citizenship, because I think you know, one of your first images was the public toilet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, I mean, if you look at the kind of early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, that you see this investment into, you know, civic infrastructure, you know, the public toilet, the public bath, the wash house, you know, the, the kind of public works department um, produces this incredible kind of civicness, mm. which has obviously become privatised and we've lost that. So there's a kind of nostalgia to get back that, that kind of public um, works. And I just, I wonder if you've got any kind of, Thoughts on that um, in terms of kind of this future of infrastructure. I mean, there's now a big conversation in Australia about considering housing as infrastructure. Mm, mm. As you think about roads as infrastructure, there's money available, there's investment. But we don't talk about the need for housing as infrastructure um, from a health and wellbeing perspective. No, that's right. And that would be an enormously radical gesture. But then we'd first have to get back to this notion of the public good. Um, it's a concept that uh, has in a way, it's a concept we're all somewhat aware of, but we feel like when we utter it, it's to be nostalgic. But what if we were to quite seriously call on this idea of a public good? Um, this is a challenge that Nancy Levinson of Places um, magazine has recently raised, but I think we also hear it in Dana Cuff's work when she speaks on the public. And, and this is exactly what infrastructure should ideally serve and, you know, how we as a body politic work together um, sufficient in our modes of governance that we can kind of share our infrastructural goods and make a demand that these are, are, are available and um, are rendered as public, public resources. And if we were able to imagine something like housing as a basic fundamental human right and public good, this would be an enormously radical gesture. I remember you raising this um, late last year at some point uh, to think of housing as infrastructure. You know, what are the implications of that? I think that's a really powerful thought, uh, for I mean, sure. The, the danger and I think, you know, people's understanding of infrastructure start to think about mass housing and standardization. So, you know, you, you, you start to, I think there's opportunities, I think, if you look back at Abraken's work in um, the open building, which was a reaction to that. Okay. So, you know, there is an interesting um, um, opportunity, I think. I mean, the other thing, just, you know, in a, in a post-COVID world, I mean, I think, again, looking back at this huge investment into public infrastructure, um, um, you know, when we, when we were living at the, um, you know, through you know, post-World War I, up to the point where we found a vaccine, if you like, for tuberculosis, and you look at what happened there in terms of the, the, the kind of integration of architecture and the kind of humanities, um, um, uh, or a kind of total design. And I mean, Shannon talked about this implosion and explosion of, of design. Mm -hmm. You know, really at that point when, when the physical space had to react to a pandemic, um, you know, what, what happens once the vaccine comes in is you see a decoupling of architecture um, in many respects um, and a reliance on medicine. And, 
And I wonder in this post-pandemic world, what the opportunities are to re kind of calibrate architecture's position um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, a, in a broader discourse about That's city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I will, I will go back to some questions. So um, Professor Bates has, all, has, has got a question. Is it possible to make the definition or nomination of infrastructure into a too large, too inclusive determination such that almost everything is part of infrastructure? Or is an infrastructure to the point at which it is, too, it is no longer possible to actually point to infrastructure without pointing to everything? <laughs> the question is, what is not infrastructure? Yeah, no, and this is a this is a really good point, I think, exactly, because you're you're always at risk, and certainly in a, in that pedagogical space too, you say, all right, let's talk to infrastructural love, and immediately you put on on those glasses, and everything potentially becomes infrastructure, um, you know, in in the way we, we can we can think about this, and we did find infrastructure everywhere, but I think what was valuable was to recognise, all right, what if what if we take infrastructure and we see the world that way. And understand how architecture supports these various infrastructures, at least um, uh, within that space of a thinking, um, it allows another point of view on, on things. I believe so. It was it was a it was an exercise in that way. And yes, it's always at risk of um, making everything look like infrastructure. But then once you attend uh, to those specific instances, you can begin to draw out, uh, you know, what else is at work there. And I, mean, I was just going over. Um, uh, Reinhold Martin's urban apparatus again and looking you know to how he's specifically trying to uh, frame what infrastructure is but one of his aims is really to get the social and the material present there but neither does he want to let everything in so to speak um, and tries to kind of bring a particular focus onto it through a, his series of essays uh, but certainly it's a risk. Um, so, what, so what about the building then? I, I mean yeah. I I know we can look at the building as, a, as an infrastructure, but I mean, is there a danger, do you think, in all of this that we, we somehow abandon the, um, the building? Um, and I, look, I suppose going back to Reinhold's, um, some of his criticism was about, you, there was a slight embarrassment about some of, it, some of the American architects and their political positioning and lack of it. Um, but I, I suppose this is a bigger question about practice more generally. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, and how, does sure. all, yeah, how does all of this play out in practice? Yeah, and, and th these are exactly the sorts of questions that we were constantly raising within critical studies, uh, looking to the fact that, you know, when you complete an architecture degree, for instance, um, what you do as an architect will take on many different, uh, you know, task shapes, I suppose. And uh, it might be that you at no point, in fact, work on a building, or perhaps you only work on a small part of a building. So certainly um, within our studio, we're interested in uh, not focusing on that particular object that is architecture, but of course, recognizing that we're sitting amidst a broader field of other studios, also educating students, where in other studios, there would be the focus on the object. So if within a school of architecture, you want to diversify approaches to how we understand architecture, um, then, uh, you know, there's got to be a space in which you, you rethink that suite of architectural skills. So one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the ideas we've often explored is how to produce an architectural project that has no built object as an outcome. It's rather a deploying that suite of architectural skills that you've been developing over your years as a student to instead render something visible about your environment, uh, to call attention to some uh, political issue, um, to undertake work in a sort of more participatory vein, for instance, um, that is about community outreach, for instance, um, and that these skills can be deployed in other ways to, to communicate uh, spatial and political problems as well. I think, you, I mean, you touched on that, I think, in the interview with Shannon Martin, um, where she was talking about the artefact encyclopedia. And I think you described it like an exercise in following the material and understanding its complex network relationships. That's right. Um, you know, and I think, I mean, it was a really interesting point, I think, that was made there about this kind of conceptual shift that's required, you know, um, especially to achieve inside a design kind of studio environment. The design does not have to end up in a beautiful folly, 
but instead in a well-articulated visual argument. And I think that's a no, really... No, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And I mean, we were, we were, we were, <laughs> we're... We were doing, um, we were always risking doing both and, you know, so, you know, some of the projects that the, the students produced, like Marlon's beautiful follies about caring for soil and caring for labourers, you know, they turned into these beautiful follies and, and they were very obviously so. And in a way, ex exactly their delight was their failure. Um, and yet... Uh, they weren't even designed objects that she was proposing to be constructed so much of a, as a way of thinking in that particular site of engagement and thinking around some of her readings um, to do with soil and thinking about issues of labour. And so through the very process of design, this enabled a, a thesis of a kind to emerge. And this too was valuable for her. Yeah, the other thing, sorry, I'm, I'm going to turn to the questions in a second because there's more coming in, but... I mean, one of the things I think was interesting in terms of the, the studio project um, infrastructure love. I mean, you talk about details. I mean, you've got the students to collectively draw detail to get down to that level of scrutiny. Um, and I wonder if you could, I mean, I don't know if you remember back to one of the early MSD at Holmes with Alejandro, um, where he talked about this notion of our ideas on the, the neocon um, as a kind of new revolutionary mode um, and his thoughts on detail kind of prompted some thoughts, I think, you know, this poetry of construction and tectonics um, and a phenomenology as an outdated mode and suggests that the science of detail is more important in architecture now. So I don't know, I just wondered if you had any kind of um, thoughts on that, because it provoked quite a bit of a conversation, I think, mm -hmm. from Alejandro's talk. Very importantly, the de the de there's a number of things happening with the detail here uh, in the exercise. It's, and it very much is that idea of an exercise and the repetition. And um, it was a very unpopular exercise too, because it required a lot of drawing, um, and, uh, but it also required a lot of uh, collaboration. And uh, the, the detail was not of the kind that we would, you know, celebrate its um, exquisite beauty and how wonderful that Peter Zumpdor thing kind of, you know, that, Point meets that it was it was it was not that kind of a detail by any means. It was very much a focus on um, how very ordinary things to go together. So rather than focus uh, our attention on on the prized, exquisite, um, you know, highly refined, very expensive, and mostly inaccessible detail, um, how do we just see how things just go together in a relatively ordinary way, and and even to celebrate that. So. In a way, it was to, you know, bring the detail a bit down to earth and, and yeah. Well, I, think, I, mean, you made it, I mean, you talk about it paying attention. I mean, that was, I think, that really kind of, in a very simplistic level, you know, focusing on that, that level of um, intersection. Now, I'm just going to turn to some questions. So another anonymous one, but you talked particularly about the Tari's three ecologies, mental, social, environmental. It feels like there's often a tendency, particularly in architecture, to approach environmental ecology on its own, a sustainability discourse. How might you think the recognition of these other ecologies can be better approached? Yeah, exactly. So um, I think um, Guattari has been a, a great sort of source of provocation, I think, um, whether we're looking at Peg Raw's relational, um, relational architectural ecologies or uh, there's a great special issue of Field Journal out of Sheffield um, University actually dedicated to ecology and Guattari pops up again and again because exactly the demand he places on us is that it's not simply about, um, you know, it's not a technical fix. Well, if we just make our buildings more sustainable, everything will be better. Uh, it's all very well to um, claim high sustainability status, but if we still have the same ha habits of consumption and so forth, um, then we're not, we're not necessarily, you know, um, uh, making much of a dent in terms of climate change and so forth. This is an argument, actually, another colleague of mine, Jonathan Metzger, in his sustainable, Stockholm Sustainable City articulates, you know, Stockholm has a very high rating, apparently, in terms of sustainability, but uh, looked... looked um, turn the formula around from another point of view and see all the importation of certain kinds of goods and we see habits of consumption that, you know, outweigh a supposedly, a supposedly sustainable way of managing, you know, en energy production and circulation. 
and uh, certain, um, uh, uh, you know, supposedly sustainable building practices and so forth. So if we sort of extend our point of view a little bit wider, we see uh, things are a bit more complex. And the beauty of Guattari in, in an essay that's not the easiest essay to read by no means um, is that he following Gregory Bates and the anthropologist and second order cyberneticist tells us that we have to expand what we understand by ecology. We are in ecology too. It's not as though we can do something to it. Um, it's not as though we can use it to solve a problem by being ecological. Uh, so this kind of bringing us across the three registers and importantly understanding how the mental, social and environmental have to be hooked together uh, becomes a very powerful way of reorientating our approach. Um, it asks us to kind of... Uh, attempt to go a little bit deeper in terms of our habits of consumption, perhaps, and uh, habits of getting along with each other. What does the ethics of care potentially mean for a rethinking of history and theory being taught in an architecture undergraduate? Wow, that's a good question. Oh, this is going to really hurt my head by the end of the evening, Alan. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. I just need to say that first, okay? <laughs> That's all. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I still remember when I first came across the ethics of care as a formulation when I went back to study philosophy and I, I, I did this great course at um, Murdoch uh, University in Perth, Western Australia at the ends of the earth uh, called Moral Philosophy. And we got up to a week where we were talking about care ethics and we were introduced to Carol Gilligan. And it was just this, um, I mean, she's been subsequently critiqued in her particular argument, but it was, her argument was about, um, rather than thinking in terms of justice, why don't we rethink this in terms of care, which also has a sort of gender dimension to it. And then, you know, an ethics of care allows us to also develop that uh, a more of a sort of feminist agenda too. Uh, we can look to uh, uh, labour politics uh, through the sort of um, unpaid labour of, uh, of care. Um, and uh, it, uh, it asks us, again, it's, a, it's another challenge to um, pay attention and... Um, uh, look to all those support systems that we wouldn't get by without all the unpaid labor that's making our work lives possible um, for instance and so uh, in that especially in critical studies a lot of what we were attempting to do was to create a space in which we could discuss architecture in relation to gender the ethics of care um, you know in a number of instances through what we were doing with studio work and in our seminars became a very powerful way of uh, rethinking politics, rethinking justice, um, rethinking, you know, what it is that it means to, in a very banal sense, care for the spaces that we're occupying, um, which then also leads us to repair and maintenance as particular approaches yeah. as well. Um, a question from Alex Felson. It is interesting to think about humans and infrastructure in comparison to species and nature that function as ecosystem engineers defined as an organism that creates, significantly modifies and maintains or breaks down a habit. This includes beavers or giant kelp off the coast of Australia and Tasmania. Is this just a metaphor or a direct comparison? And how is human activity mm -hmm. in creating infrastructure similar or different from this? Some good questions coming in tonight. Yeah, yeah, there certainly are. Well, first I would say that I'm pretty sure Alex has a good answer to this question and we should let him oh, answer it next week. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm a little bit wary of um, metaphor. This is where, even though, you know, maybe I'm at risk of swallowing too much second order cyberneticist thinking, I don't know, but um, reading Gregory Bates and I find always very inspiring. So it really is to take quite seriously that humans have a kind of particular activity, much as beavers has a, have a kind of um, activity, whether it's a, which involves work on their, um, you know, their ecosystems. And um, to not speak of it merely as metaphor, uh, but to really understand these different actors and what they do to environments, some with more devastating effects than others. For instance, humans manage to really do a pretty bad job of how they deal with their ecosystems systems as we all know um, but I think it's definitely interesting to kind of draw attention uh, to these other non-human actors and I think there's a lot of people across the environmental humanities who are doing that kind of work as well. So I've got a slightly um, constructive critique um, Christina has suggested here um, coming from the environmental humanities 
um, it's potentially troubling to see the misappropriation of our discipline into wordy jargons. Um, is there danger applying trendy buzzwords into design studios like post-human, more than human, and post-anthropocene without knowing the implications of their use? Um, and um, as architects running such a studio, how, how do you ensure proper care and taking when engaging into these dialogues? Um, what do you say for that? Mm. No, this is a very good critique. And this is, also, this is also the kind of critique that the moment you place disciplines alongside each other are apt um, to be rendered. And we're always at risk of this in the design studio. And this is why specifically in the design studios that we were running, uh, part of what we did would uh, be to um, embed four theory seminars. Within those theory seminars, we would introduce students to this discourse through a series of key uh, essays. Uh, we drew in particular from, um, you know, because I think it's a very helpful collection from the uh, Routledge Companion to the Environmental Humanities. There are other sources, of course, for this. We read across the issues with um, the concept of the Anthropocene. Um, whether using Donna Haraway or Catherine Yusuf's another great source. And, you know, for my part, drawing on my own training as a philosopher, which also involves some cultural studies and literary theory, uh, feeling that I'm able in that position to lead students through those kinds of seminars in which we problematise the concepts and help them to understand the difficulty of thinking through them. Um, and the projects also to draw attention, and this is why the poetic pragmatics was very important to us, to see them as exercises, not to posit them as uh, projects that we would anticipate were to be built, but to remember that we're in a learning, we're in a space of learning together. And we use the projects as something like thought experiments, not as something that we're going to take out to develop, a, to undertake. And in the instance of Eric's project of the post-human embassy, he agonised for weeks exactly over such questions. All right, once we set up an embassy, what is the relation of the human? What are the implications here? Uh, if a human is to visit, you know, he thought all the way through this right down to the outfit that a human would, would have to wear to enter this other environment that he was producing. So he was really, it was, he was definitely complicating this. So it's always important to avoid mere jargon or buzzwords. And the way you avoid that is by also opening up a space for discussion and giving students the opportunity to enter the discourse. I mean, architecture can often be assumed of um, poaching concepts from elsewhere. And I've talked about this at length myself. Um, but if, on the other hand, we don't introduce um, our design students to concepts drawn from other fields and we close them in their own silo, then they're not able to, um, you know, ex expand their critical capacity to think through these other concepts. So uh, I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a very easy critique of, of architects to assume them, uh, to, um, to accuse them of misappropriation. I've made the same argument myself several times, you know, uh, being a long time scholar of Deleuze, I've endlessly accused architects of misappropriating various of Deleuze's concepts, but it kind of misses the point because if we're going to all kind of be so territorial about what we're doing, um, then I don't really see how we're going to get along with each other. And so there's, I think, a real importance to respect the distinction between our dis disciplinary expertise, but also to come together, whether it's in symposia, of which I've been to many. I was very involved in the um, Post-Humanities Institute in Stockholm, um, set up by Cecilia Orsberg there, as well as the Environmental Humanities Unit um, that I was very involved in. So um, these are coming from real spaces of dialogue and also in the institution where we would have members of the environmental humanities and the post-humanities um, that Cecilia was opening up, coming and visiting us and talking to us through this. So this is, this is not just a sort of, um, this is not just a throwaway thing. This is like a serious investment in many people's time in working through those institutional relationships and respecting those other disciplines and so forth. Um, and I just really want to stress that. I mean, just on that, I mean, I suppose the studio was run in 2018. I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious, Helene, about your homecoming in many respects. I mean, I know you're, you grew up in Perth, but you're know, coming back to Melbourne, coming back to Australia seven years later, 
from a Swedish context, which I know is a very, I mean, in terms of it's quite a traditional architectural school um, in, in the sense of, you know, we're, we're a large um, kind of um, um, built environment um, kind of faculty. But really, the, in terms of rethinking a studio like this, given what's just happened in 2020, I mean, it's quite catastrophic. You know, we start to give the bushfires, you look at what's happened, you know, across America that's spilled into the, in, right across the world. Um, and then we consider a post-pandemic context. I mean, what are the, some of the things specifically, the differences, the points of difference in coming back to Australia, things that you think are completely distinctive here mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that you would like to get your teeth into? Oh, no, certainly. Um, it, is a, it is a bit of a reverse culture shock um, in some ways. Uh, I mean, eight years is both a long period of time and also not so many years at all after all somehow, especially in that we're coming back to Melbourne, so to a, a context that's quite familiar. Um, there is a big difference in coming from a much smaller school of architecture uh, to a much larger one. Certainly that's quite hard because there's so much more uh, of an institutional layering, so much more bureaucracy here. I don't think I've ever been to so many committee meetings in my whole entire life, added all together. <laughs> It's also a little bit hard to assess because if you think of it, uh, we've all been working from home since mid-March, basically. And so really getting a feel for your institutional context becomes all the more of a challenge. But here, you know, I'd mostly be thinking of our, our younger incoming students because if I'm suffering a little bit from this, then to imagine starting your university degree uh, without stepping foot on campus, this is this is really an extraordinary thing. Yeah, um, yeah. it's well, not really to answer your question; it's to talk around it, really. Well, I suppose I mean it's like part of this was not just about the university context, but I suppose just in terms of the Australian context. Um, I mean, we're, we're dealing with global um, conditions um, and kind of a, a lot of homogenised problems, but you know, from a distinctive. Um, Australian context, um, you know, I think there's major opportunities um, within a kind of similar kind of studio context. Um, but I'm just going to turn to another question. I think there's a feeling for a lot of theorists, Mark, Mark Fisher most notably, that the idea of the future has been somewhat foreclosed in the past as well, through a weaponization of nostalgia by capital. Do you think there's a sense that the future and the past have been brought into are weaponized um, by capital. When you talk about speculative projects and when we talk about other futures, you think there's um, a sense of being able to escape that monopolization of our own time? Well, yeah. No, I can't answer that question. Where is it? I'm looking for it in the question list. This is a, this is a good question. And um, it's one of the anonymous attendees. Seven, yeah, yeah. Seven, uh, and yeah, bringing up Mark Fisher as well, for sure, um, in the midst of this and whether, whether there is this just sense of a temporal collapse into the present moment, uh, whether we can be so daring to have any hope whatsoever. Um, uh, these are all very good questions. Uh, and yet we've got to do something somehow. Um, and I think this is also a struggle in being a pedagogue too, if, uh, uh, looking around and feeling rather bleak about things, I guess the biggest challenge about coming back to Australia is a pretty obvious one, frankly, but um, in terms of politics, not that things were going that well in Sweden. This is where I'm thinking about how do we talk with our students through this? How do we equip them to uh, be designers and also politically astute um, or m maybe even to make other demands that things might be different? I don't know. Can we be so optimistic? I don't know. That, that's, it's rather a bleak question in a way. Yeah. yeah. Now, look, I'm probably, I'm not I'm conscious we're getting quite close to the end, but look, you talked, I mean, I, I thought it'd be quite good to just, you know, turn back to, you know, you, your inspiration. You, you draw from, I would say, you know, radical feminist thinkers. You've talked about Donna Haraway, Isabel Stengers, Jane Bennett, Rossi, Radotti, Maria Pook, La Bella Casa and Carmen Barad. Um, and the rele relevance of their perspectives for architecture and urban studies. And more specifically, you know, you talked a lot tonight about Haraway's situated viewpoints and Stenger's ecology of practices. Um, 
you know, see, this is becoming more and more evident, I think, in, in, your, um, in your writing. Um, so I just wondered if you could just touch on that a bit more, um, um, just to kind of round off the, the presentation tonight. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, um, I think uh, across all of those thinkers, and there are certainly disagreements amongst them, and there are some with whom I would have disagreements as well, what I find a very fascinating set of relationships, you know, the dialogues between Stengers and Haraway um, in terms of their projects, the, the sort of um, acknowledgement of each other's work, or, you know, likewise, um, Stengers and Latour and Latour and Haraway, or, you know, uh, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, who's a student of, of Donna Haraway. Um, and so the lines of influence there. And, and there's, there's a sense of... Um, you know, there's a sense of a, a really extraordinary matrix or, 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 or scheme of companion thinkers thinking together. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, sort of, um, there's something extraordinary about trying to think somewhere in the vicinity of them or to, or to, find, or to find some track of thinking alongside or with them. And... Um, and uh, bring this thinking back into a discipline such as architecture or, or something even more broadly defined as the creative practices, because a lot of what I write about then is sitting rather at the further reaches of architecture to the point at which maybe it wouldn't even be recognised. It's beginning to look more like performance art or it uh, um, uh, looks like, uh, you know, something that's uh, about stitching or it's, uh, it's sort of challenging that outer... Uh, perimeter of architecture it's very not much not about that autonomous object in a way and anyway I think they just the opportunities they allow us to think with and through the concepts they set out and through the sort of challenges to the way um, we habitually think I think there's a lot of uh, just benefit in that and but challenge too yeah we also I think you mentioned before I mean before about Karen and Frank who you you talk about this notion of embracing connectedness inclusiveness and subjectivity and complexity rather than abstraction and dualistic thinking. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think that captures it really well. Um, and I think, you, you, I mean, again, within that, that paper, um, it talks about working from within um, a position of hasty surveys, leaps to generalized, con generalized conclusions of theories resorting to ready-made categories and convenient binaries. These become inadequate. Um, you know, so pushing really for, for maintaining respect for diversity of disciplinary mm. practices that inform architectural research, such as ethnography and philosophy. So I think it's a really nice way of kind of summing it up. I'm paraphrasing you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it makes me also think of the great challenges Isabel Doucet and I had when we were plotting our, plotting our special issue of Architectural Theory Review, yeah. um, how we felt we were searching for something and not quite getting there. Um, but, you know, it's this ongoing work that one undertakes, I think. Okay, so I'm going to finish on one last question from, from Donald. You mentioned, I think, in this, is this correct, speculative pragmatics and then poetic pragmatics. How are these different and why are both extended by pragmatics in the mm -hmm. sense that you mentioned ordinary, ordinary pragmatics as opposed to the common philosophical des designation of pragmatics? Okay, so this was the detour that I took briefly when I invited people to put on some soft, soothing music and so forth. Um, I've been, I've been um, getting a lot out of reading uh, the collaborative work of Isabel uh, Stengers and Didier Debes, who mount a particular argument around uh, um, speculative pragmatism. Um, and in that, uh, the pragmatism is... Uh, um, goes back to the American pragmatist philosophers um, uh, such as um, uh, William James and, um, uh, you know, in particular in Dewey, um, but then looking forward a little bit to um, Alfred North Whitehead and his work. And so it's a, it's a particularly kind of philosophical sense of pragmatism. And, I mean, William James, James is most, most well known for this idea of a, a stream of consciousness within which we, we find ourselves. But um, um, uh, so the, the, the pragmatism there, and I was distinguishing it then between a kind of uh, more everyday 
pragmatics and a um, and a and and the philosophical sense, but I think there are also connections there that we were trying to draw out with the poetic pragmatics, uh, the pragmatics of sort of acknowledging this being uh, in the midst of an everyday flux. Uh, as well as trying to kind of aesthetically uh, respond to it, I suppose. Um, so, uh, and the poetic pragmatics was especially, I, I think, um, wonderful for us because we felt like as a group of people, we'd come up with a concept that was describing something. You know, we were, we were trying to achieve something that was nearly impossible to achieve between this sort of, um, uh, you know, leap into a complex uh, of immediate experiences as well as, you know, answering through some aesthetic test site or test object uh, to think with through our design exercises. And, um, um, yeah. Great. I think that's a perfect way to, to end the Q&A and the talk. So, look, a huge thank you, Helene, um, for, for putting your hand up to be the first of the... Yeah, the first guinea pig, exactly. Well, thanks, Donald Bates, for this. Um, yeah, and a, and a big thank you to Donald for provoking us to to um, get our academics um, um, onto Zoom um, to present as part of MSD at home. Now, we've got quite a packed schedule over the coming weeks. Tomorrow, um, Donald will be hosting Eva Castro. Um, on Thursday, I'll be back with um, Rory Hyde from the V&A um, in London. Um, and then again next week, um, we've got another MSD at home series. Um, um, so look out for the schedule. Please keep an eye on our, our website. Um, um, Alex Felson will be in conversation with Julie Willis as well next week um, on the 8th of September. Um, so fantastic and packed schedule. Um, and a huge thank you for everyone that's been listening in and for all the Q&A. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Alan. See you later. Thank you. Good night.